Okay, well here we are, lesson 13, as I mentioned, 1 Corinthians. Let's open our Bibles there. Now in this final chapter of 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul reviews several matters and then he leaves several words of encouragement to his readers. Uh, some of the things that he says to encourage the, uh, the brethren, first of all, to treat young and inexperienced men with honor and be gentle with them. I like the idea, be gentle with the, the young guys. They don't, always know what they're, uh, they don't always know what they're doing, so be gentle with them. Secondly, to look forward to the visit of Apollos, uh, who was another preacher, a very good uh, speaker at that time, uh, who, was a, uh, who was also a very mature teacher. Look forward to that. Uh, number three, to be careful of their faith, to be alert against sinfulness and division, and also treat each other with love. And of course, he reminds that he spent a long, you know, a whole chapter talking about how they should treat one another, how they should encourage one another. Reminds them once again of that. Number four, to respect the ones who lead in supporting mission work and benevolence. And he says an interesting thing here. He says to see these type of people as leaders in the church. Um, you know, the true image of leaders that Paul talks about are not just corporate types. You know, we see that in our, you know, in our society, corporate types. They're, they're the leaders, they're the shakers, the movers. You know? And sometimes even in the church I've seen that some uh, men have been you know, elevated to leadership positions because they've had for some reason or other some sort of success in the, in the corporate world. But here he talks about the ones who actually get their hands dirty in the work of the church, the ones who actually do the work. He says those are the ones who are the leaders. Respect those people who are, who are in there with the flock, who are, you know, who are actually doing the work. You know, the time to delegate is when you have too much to do, not, not just to get out of doing it yourself. You know, a lot of times you know, I've worked on the other side of the fence. You know, I've, I haven't always been a preacher. I've worked in, for corporations, big corporations, and I've seen that happen, you know, people delegate stuff just because they don't want to do it. You know. It doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in corporate America or in the military or you know, you're teaching, so on and so forth, you find out pretty quickly who are the ones that are actually you know, carrying the load, the ones pushing, the ones doing the work. And so even in the church, Paul says, respect those who are doing the work. Bless them, encourage them. Um, he also gives a variety of greetings to various individuals in the church and he offers a blessing to each one uh, of these individuals and then a final blessing on the church itself. So at the beginning of the chapter he talks about a special collection and the details surrounding that special collection. So instead of going back through the reviewing part, because he does a review of his own material, he does introduce a, a new idea or a different idea in chapter 16, talks about a special collection. And the thing about this particular verse in 1 Corinthians 16 is that a lot of our information about giving in the church comes from this reference. So I'd like to focus in on this one reference here as we finish out our series. He talks about the collection for the saints in chapter 16. So let's read beginning in chapter 16, verse one. He says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. Now, we're not exactly sure which collection Paul is talking about here. He's talking about a collection, but there were several, it seems. We know that in Acts 11.27, there was a special collection on behalf of the people in Jerusalem for the poor. And in Acts chapter 12, verse 25, the Bible says that Paul completed this mission and he turned over the money to the people in Jerusalem. So we knew about that collection. And then in other passages, Paul does promise to care for the poor. Romans chapter 15, verse 26, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, he talks about the poor and taking care of them. And so this could have been a kind of an ongoing you know, an ongoing ministry that he was involved in. In any case, 
This was a special collection that he is referring to and both Paul and the Corinthians knew about it and so no further details are given. You know, he figures they know what he's talking about, he doesn't have to explain it, we simply have to surmise which of the special collections is he talking about. But that isn't the point anyways, which collection is not the point. In verses two to, two to four, let's keep reading. He says, on the first day of every week, let each one of you put aside and save as he may prosper, that no collections be made when I come. And when I arrive, whomever you may approve, I shall send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. Here he gives details on how he wants this special collection to be organized. Some more information about this particular offering. Number one, he says on the first day, refers to the Lord's Day, which is Sunday, which was the day that early Christians met for worship. Secondly, he says each first day, each person had to set aside what he had collected for this special collection, that this thing was prepared, that people set it aside, it wasn't a last minute thing, it wasn't like, oh, the special collection, well, what have I got? Maybe I've got you know, a couple of coins here. You know, it was prepared, set aside. Third thing he says, he said when he came, he wanted no collection to be made. In other words, the special collection should have taken place before his arrival, and he explains a little bit later that this would avoid embarrassment. Imagine the embarrassment. They've talked up this special collection, they've committed themselves to this special collection for whatever, and then he arrives and no special collection. So somebody forgot to do it and they go, oh my, at the last minute. You know? So he said, let's have no embarrassments here. Let's make sure we take care of this business before I come. Fourth thing he says about it. He says, he himself will not handle the money, but will accompany whoever is appointed to carry it along with letters of introduction and explanation to its final destination. Boy, just that in itself is good advice for all preachers. I know for a fact that uh, Marty and I, for example, we don't handle the money. Sometimes it would be convenient, you know, we're already in the office, we, you know, we, it, we, we're there, we'd have time to count it, and, you know, we, but we never, ever, touch the money. I don't think I've ever, I've never touched the money. Even in Montreal where we didn't have as many people and uh, uh, you know, it, uh, we didn't have as many volunteers is the point that I'm making. Even then we found somebody other than myself to handle the money. It's just not a good idea for, the, for the, the guy who's in the pulpit doing the preaching and teaching to also be handling the money. Not, not, a, good, not a good idea. And then number five, he also encourages them to give according to their prosperity according to their own particular wealth. And I think we're familiar, if you're a member of the Church of Christ, you're familiar with these ideas. This is the pattern that we follow. Now, we find out in 2 Corinthians that these brethren did not follow through on this teaching. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, the, the apostle you know, spells it out clearly, point by point, what they're supposed to do, and they don't do it. And Paul had to encourage them to finish the good work that they had begun in this matter, 2 Corinthians 8. So even, even at a time where there were individuals in the church who could do miraculous things, you know, like heal or speak in tongues and prophecy and all that kind of stuff, even though they had an apostle of the Lord Jesus who himself could do miracles, who had actually demonstrated miraculous power to these people. Even with all of this, they still didn't follow through on the money part. They still didn't follow through on the collection part, on the giving part. You know, giving is, a, is, a, is one of the ministries, shall we say, that is slow in developing. You know, sometimes people come into the church, they're very enthusiastic and they, boy, they can share their faith. They only know three things, maybe. You know, they know uh, Jesus is the Son of God, that we need to repent and be baptized to be saved. That's all they know, but boy, they're ready to share and that's great. You know? But the giving part, it's, in my experience anyways, is just something that takes a long time to develop, to evolve. 
it takes a lot of teaching and a lot of encouragement you know, to get young Christians to mature to the point where they do this very thing that Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians 16, to think, to set aside in advance a portion for the Lord, to give it on a regular basis. You know? It just takes a lot of time to develop and to cultivate that particular aspect of spiritual maturity. And I, I'm saying that simply because these people here, they had the, the apostle himself teaching them and they were slow to respond to this, to this idea. Well, from this passage, we model the way that we collect money today, not only for special works, but also for our everyday work in the church. From this example, we have a pattern of several things that help us in our uh, weekly um, ministry. First of all, it says that they met regularly on the first day of the week, meaning the Corinthians. In Acts chapter 20 verse 7 we see that this pattern was established early and it was blessed by the apostles that the Christians meet on the Lord's day in public worship for the communion, for the breaking, you know, the breaking of bread, for prayer, for worship, for uh, for teaching, for fellowship, so on and so forth. This pattern is established early on. That's why we do it. Secondly, they contributed for the work of the church. The Corinthians were no strangers to giving as a regular feature of their assemblies. Paul says to them, you know, according to the collection, so on and so forth, I directed the churches of Galatia. All, the, all these churches follow this particular pattern. Now I'm giving you this information because I want you to do the same thing that they're doing. So this was not a specific teaching to a specific congregation. It was Paul's general teaching to all the churches wherever he went in as far as uh, uh, giving was concerned to the church, this was the pattern that, that, he was, uh, that he was giving. Now Paul in this passage gives special instructions about a special need and this is why he insists that at his appearing no collections be made. But early church historians, Pliny for example, write that the church regularly took up offerings during their weekly Sunday meetings, in case we might read the Bible and think this may be an exception, this may just have happened one time. Historians who were recording the history of the early church confirmed the fact that this was a regular feature of Christian worship at the earliest, at the quote apostolic time, when the apostles were alive, this is what the church would do, gather regularly on the Lord's day and among other things would have a collection for the work of the church. So the New Testament example of this being done here is confirmed by others who lived and who wrote about these times. Um, another thing, they were concerned about the quantity of giving as well as orderliness in the handling of money. See, even at that time, you know, they, they didn't have wire transfers and drop boxes in the bank and all those type of conveniences, QuickBooks, you know. They didn't have all of that, what we have today to keep a record of our giving. However, they insisted on orderliness and the fact that he says that certain brethren would be appointed, letters would be given, he would accompany them if necessary, all points to the idea that they were not lackadaisical about taking care of the funds that they had. They were very, very careful with this particular ministry. And Paul, of course, encourages giving in proportion to prosperity. Uh, in the time of the law, uh, when they were uh, under the law of Moses, obviously there was a fixed rate, uh, a tenth, ten percent, that was the law. The idea of the law being written on your heart, uh, God was asking not for a specific amount, but for an amount that the individual decided, an amount that was generous according to what he or she had been uh, prospered. The idea is you cannot give what you don't have, but you can give a portion of what you do have. And that, to, uh, and that is uh, to God's uh, glory. And that's the part that God's interested in. He's not interested in what we can't give. Boy, I've heard people say this. You know, if I was wealthy, if I was really wealthy, I'd pay off the church's mortgage. And if we needed a, 
uh, a facility in the back of the, uh, uh, back of the uh, property, you know, and build a multi-purpose building there. I just, I oh mean, I'd write a check and I'd build that thing, you know, and we could just get on with it. It would be great for our young people, for our families. And, and of course, I'm not saying that doesn't come from a sincere heart. But I mean, that's just, you know, that's like if I won a million or if my, you know, if an unknown relative left me money. I'll tell you something, even the relatives I know won't leave me money. So I, I'm pretty sure that the ones that I don't know are not going to leave me any money either. <laughs> the point I'm making here is, you know, God's not interested in wishful thinking, what we would do, what we would do if we had. He's not interested in that. He's interested in what are you doing and what, with what you have, whether it be great or small. And this is the point that, that Paul is, is making here. We also see uh, the care he gives in making sure that the money is accounted for, I mentioned that, for by people who are trustworthy and that it is used for what it's, it's intended. You know, to use it for its intention. You know, in the churches of Christ, one of our guiding principles is that in order to be the church of the Bible, we must do things according to the teachings of the Bible. Well, it's important to be the church of the Bible because the Bible says it's the only church that's saved. And we do things Bible ways, no matter what they are, as far, you know, taking the communion, handling the money, uh, organizing things, all these details are given to us in God's word. And so if we want to be the church of the New Testament, which is our goal, which is our mission, you know, other churches have mission statements. We plan to be a loving church. We want to be the friendliest church. Well, you know, I've never, I've never I ever, have I ever seen anywhere a church that says, don't come here, we're not friendly. <laughs> they don't say things like, all churches are friendly. All churches are friendly, or try to be. Our mission statement is we want to be the church of the New Testament because if we're that church, then we've encompassed, we've, we've put all the things together that God wants from us if we are the church of the New Testament. Now, I want to talk a little bit about a, a bigger idea here than just the collection, and that is the idea of the pattern. The Bible teaches us in a variety of ways. You know, I teach in a variety of ways. I use handouts for people who like to take notes. I use overheads for people who are more visual, just like to follow along. Uh, there's audio. Uh, this class, for example, we're making, uh, uh, Hal is, is making a video of this class. And uh, in a couple of weeks from now, you'll be able to have all 13 lessons on DVD. So I use you know, different methods to, to teach. And so does the Bible. It uses different ways to teach. For example, it gives us a clear command or instruction of what we should do or what we should not do, or how and when or where to do it, and so on and so forth. For example, when and how and why to do the Lord's Supper. It gives us those instructions. Should we have it every day of the week? Should we, should we have, uh, should we have ch Cheetos and Coca-Cola, Diet co I mean, you know, how should we do it and what should the elements be? Well, the New Testament gives us that type of information. Or how to respond to the gospel. Once I've heard the gospel and I want to be saved, how should I respond? Well, you know, the Bible tells us, repent, be baptized. You know, it gives us that information. How should I be baptized? Should I just throw water on me? Should I go under the water? Should I splash it onto myself? How should I do it? The Bible tells us exactly how to do these things. So one of the ways that it teaches us is by giving us explicit commands things we can see where it says do this or don't do that. But that's not the only way it teaches us. It also teaches us through examples. It provides examples of the apostles and the early church living the Christian life and carrying out the Lord's will. So we see by example things that the apostles did and that the early church did under the direction of the apostle and we can, we can copy that, we can do as they did. So we can emulate or follow their example in attitude or in work or in teaching. You know, um, it doesn't say anywhere, it doesn't, there's no command that says Every time you have communion, you have to take 
you know, everybody takes the bread and the wine. There's no command that says that you know, someplace. You know, when you do communion, make sure that every single member takes the bread and every single member. We don't have a command for that, but we have an example of it. We have an example of, of, of the Lord with His disciples. And everyone, not just the Lord, but everyone takes the bread. And then everyone shares in the fruit of the vine. So there's, there, there's no defense for the idea of saying, well, only, let's say, the minister takes the bread and the wine and the congregation only takes the bread. My question is, where did you get instructions or examples to do your communion in that way? And the answer will have to be, if they're honest, the answer is, well, there is nothing in the Bible that gives me an example or a command to do things in that way. And then, Aside from a, a clear command, aside from a variety of examples, apostolic examples that we can follow, this one's a little trickier, but also the Bible allows us to draw certain conclusions based on information that it provides. Like, um, you know, if we didn't have television, farmers, you know, or anyone for that matter, before TV, uh, there was nothing in the book or in the paper that said, it will rain. It will pour today. You know, they'd look up at the sky, they'd look at the evidence, and they would conclude, hmm, wow, that south wind is blowing strong. Whoops, I see those thunderheads coming. Uh, it's going to rain. You know, you, we draw inferences all the time. We draw conclusions all the time about the information that surrounds us. That's why God's given us a brain. Well, in the same way, we can draw conclusions about spiritual things that we read about in the Bible. For example, that there was always two or more elders for each congregation. How do we always have two? Here we have eight, but many churches have six or five, or I know some churches have 25, some have only two, but I've never been in a church of Christ that has only one elder. Why is that? Well, that's because when you read through the New Testament, you find out that every single time elders are mentioned, they're always mentioned in the plurality. They're always elders, two, or more elders. And so from this we can reason with our minds that plurality of elders is the Bible way of doing things. On the opposite, you know, the opposite idea, uh, you know, there's, oh, there are many churches that have what's called a pastoral system. The pastor is the general manager of the church. He's in charge. You know, he's the pastor, he's in charge of everything. And many churches operate in that way. Sometimes some very large churches, you know, thousands of people. You've got the main pastor, that's the pastoral system, the main guy, he's the president, he's the whatever he is of that group of people. And that system kind of works well. It's like a benevolent uh, despotism. You know? <laughs> the, the guy who's in charge can get a lot of things done because he doesn't have to have a meeting with 16 other guys. He can just say, we're going to do this, and that's the end of that. You know? And sometimes that makes things happen a lot faster. But is it the Bible way? You could not support a church structure of having a main pastor, a one guy, from simply reading the New Testament. That's a very human organizational model, but it's not a biblical model. The biblical model is always a plurality of leadership, always. The 12 apostles. Jesus could have, could Jesus have given it to one guy and say, okay, I'm giving you power, I'm giving you wisdom, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm going to be always with you. Get out there, find some other people, you know, organized. He could have done that, but he didn't. He chose 12 guys who argued with each other for three years. <laughs> you know, plurality of leadership is the biblical example that we have. So, when we try to figure out how or when or why to do something uh, or other, these are the principles that guide us. If there's a command in the Bible for this, and if so, what is the command? You know, we ask ourselves. Or can we find any examples of the apostles or churches doing this with approval? Now churches in the New Testament, they did things that the apostles didn't approve of. They argued and they debated with each other or they, there was division. Of course, the apostles didn't approve of that. But are there things that they did that were approved of by the apostles? Can we find those? And then thirdly, can we logically infer or deduce that this is what the apostles or early church did in certain circumstances 
from the information that we have. These are the ways that we figure out what the Bible is actually saying to us. Now, there are other ways that we come to understand how to be uh, the church of the Bible. There are other ways. There is another, for example. It's less authoritative and it's less exact, and that is the study of what early church historians say about the early church activity and teaching, because while these things were going on, they weren't happening in a vacuum. Not all, you know, we have the 27 books of the New Testament, but let's not think for a moment that these 27 books were the only things that were ever written in the first century. They had smart people back then. They had people who were writing the history, who were observing what, were ta what was taking place in this phenomenon, just like today. There are phenomenons that take place in our society and there are those who chronicle those things. They write about them, they're historians. Well, they had historians back in those days as well. And so you had, quote, church historians who were writing about the church and what it was like. And so many of them confirm or clarify information that we already have in the Bible. For example, historians confirm that the early church met on Sunday. Uh, uh, historians confirm that the early church had a cappella music. It, it was unusual in its day because it was the only religion of the time that only used singing in its worship. Pagan worship used instruments and so on and so forth. And so you know, we, we, we find that information in the Bible, but that information is also confirmed by historians who were observing what was taking place in the early church. Now the reason I've said all of this is for the following. Here's the point, if you're wondering, what's the point? Here's the point. When it comes to the collection, we arrive at doing what we do the way we do it based on this approach. Command, example, inference, which is referred to as our hermeneutic. You hear that word sometimes thrown around, our hermeneutic. Our hermeneutic is the method that we use to interpret the Bible. Someone says, what's your hermeneutic? Well, that person is asking you, how do you approach the translation or the, rather the interpretation of the Bible? My answer to that, I search for commands, I search for examples, I search for instruction and inference that guides me in the understanding and the implementation of the Bible. So let's apply some of these rules here. Number one, there's no direct command to make a collection for the regular work of the church. There's no thou shalt collect money for the work. There's nothing that says that in a list somewhere in the New Testament. There is, however, an example of an apostle and the church meeting on the first day of the week, every week for worship, 1 Corinthians 16, Acts 27, and an example of money being collected and the reason for that money being collected. So we have more than one example of this. We can also infer that the church regularly collected money because Paul and others regularly received money to help the poor and in their ministry in Acts chapter 12 verse 25 and 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 25. Uh, one and two, we get more information that this was a regular thing. The church collected money on a regular basis and distributed among the poor to help uh, mission work and so on and so forth. And in addition to this, early church historians confirmed that the Christians met each Sunday for worship that included singing and communion and teaching and preaching and prayer and the taking up of a collection for the work of the church. We have early church historians confirming what we have examples and inferences for in the New Testament. An interesting thing also about early church historians is that they talk about things that the early church did that the Bible does not record. For example, early church historians tell us that one of the unusual things about the early Christian church is that they took in orphans. Because at that time, if you had a child that you didn't want, especially a girl child, you, you wanted male children, if you had too many girls, they would simply be left out in the field to die. They would just throw them away. And Christians, the early church, were known for going out and getting these children and saving them. There was no, quote, organized orphanage. It was just the Christian thing to do. 
We don't read about that. Any, you know, we read about you should love others and so on and so forth, but we don't read about those type of things in the Bible. We, don't, we've, we hardly read about uh, the, the suffering and the martyrdom. Uh, it, there's some references to it, you know, uh, and general references in, in Revelation done in an eschatological type of language, you know, the saints, the martyred saints, the white robes and all that. But there's not a lot of detail, but the historians provide detail of how Christians were tortured and killed and murdered uh, um, uh, in that time. So you know, it, works, it works both ways. So we don't need a direct command in order to pattern our behavior and attitudes. Not everything is thou shalt. An apostolic example, along with support References are sufficient to guide our actions so we can confidently say that what we do and how we do it are according to God's word. Today we're going to sing, we're, going to, we're teaching, we're going to, collect, uh, we're going to make a collection, uh, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. We have confidence in knowing that we're doing this all according to biblical example in command because that's the Bible way. So, how and when we collect the money for the work of the church is not necessarily the most important issue in our faith. But Jesus said that if we are faithful in little things, like an orderly way of collecting and handling the offering, if we're faithful in that, then we can be trusted with the greater things, and the greater things are the saving of souls. You know, an interesting feature of this study today is how we learn what the Bible teaches on various things, whether it be how to handle money or how to go to heaven. The approach is always the same. When we want to know what the Bible says, we need to see what it commands, what it demonstrates, and what it guides our thinking towards. And when it comes to salvation, we have an overwhelming amount of information in each area, which is proper. Imagine having more information about the money and just a little bit of information, like one or two verses about salvation. It's quite the opposite. There's a whole lot about salvation and soul winning and, and so on and so forth, and very little about the collection of money. And I think that that is in proper proportion. Sometimes, however, in the church, we spend a whole lot of time about the money and not enough time about the saving of souls. But anyways, that's a whole other issue. So what does it say? What does it say? Well, first of all, the Bible plainly commands us what we need to do to be saved. I mean, it's you know, Mark 16, believe in, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Acts 2.38, repent and uh, every one of you, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there's lots of information, but in command form, that's my point, in command form, when Jesus says those who believe and are baptized will be saved, that will be saved, that's a command, that's something you've got, to, that's not just a suggestion is what I'm saying. Secondly, it provides a lot of examples of people who were being saved and what they did to arrive at this. So in Acts 2, we have the preaching of the gospel, the command of what people ought to do, but we also have the response of the people. It says, and they came forward and 3,000 of them were baptized that day, those who accepted the message. So we have examples of how people uh, um, uh, obeyed. And finally, we read stories about people who were searching for salvation and the things that happened to them which uh, form our conclusions about what is necessary. The jailer in Acts 16, 30 to 34, what must I do to be saved, he says. You know, and then we actually see him uh, believing Christ and, and being baptized. And then, of course, Historians, I, I said they're not the main argument, but they are a supporting argument. Historians confirm that this is how the early converts were made. A wonderful book, Everett Ferguson, The History of Baptism. It's about this thick, it's a thousand pages long. Everett Ferguson is a, a world-renowned scholar. He's also a member of the Church of Christ and a, a, a professor of Bible. Um, but he has done an exhaustive study, a thousand pages, just on the subject of baptism. And this is not the theological aspect of baptism, this is the history of it, the archaeology of it. And he has pictures and uh, uh, um, you know, lithographs uh, and, 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 and descriptions of early baptismal fonts from the first century and the second century. They didn't have little, you, know, you go into some churches, you have a little stand there with a little, you know, maybe a gallon of water there. They didn't have that in the first century. In the first century, you, you, when, they, when the archeologists dig down and find these early churches, 
you have a basin, you have a, a tub, almost like a hot tub, you know, made out of tile with, with uh, graphics, you know, fish designs or things like that, where a person could be immersed. And so the historians confirm what the command, what the example, and what the inference is about salvation. So we read, and we need to believe in Jesus and confess His name. We need to repent of our sins and be immersed in His name for our sins to be forgiven and for our hearts to receive the Holy Spirit. Well, I suppose I've added that because the best way to end a study on the New Testament epistle is by encouraging listeners to obey the gospel. And that, of course, is for everyone in our auditorium today, everyone who may be listening to this DVD into the future. Thank you so much for your uh, attention. I'm, I hope the uh, study was encouraging and edifying and we continue with our teaching in the next series. God bless you.